Thomas Wyatt, or Sir Thomas Wyatt as he's known, is a very famous, very, very old poet actually. And um, yeah, I, I really like his ideas. I found him a little bit hard to get into just because the language is so old. So I remember the first time I studied a white poem that was called Who So Lister Hunt? And it was about kind of hunting a lady like she was a deer or something. Um, it, I'm not really selling him, am I? <laughs> it sounds kind of weird. But yeah, it's, it's a nice poem. I like it. And um, yeah, and I think he's a really good poet, but he's he's very, very old. So the main thing that might be difficult about this poem is the language, but I'm going to just give you a lot of vocab so that it kind of makes sense to you. Um, so the title, I Find No Peace, is quite straightforward. He's basically a speaker that is not at peace. They're restless, they're not happy, they're unsettled by something. So we're going to figure out what that is. Quite obvious here. I love another and thus I hate myself. Very dramatic. <laughs> um, so yeah, most of the vocab you can just sort of see in this bottom right hand corner. It's just words that basically are old fashioned. So they're, they're kind of old fashioned conjugations of verbs that look a bit weird. But you should be able to see when you go through that list that um, you know, there's a there's a modern English version of those words, which is quite easy, straightforward to understand, like loseth, loses, locketh, locks, holdeth, holds. Good. Um, so I'm just going to read the poem so that it's kind of clear to you. And yeah, I want you to try and figure out as I read this poem, why is he not at peace? What is the problem? Why, what's his problem, basically? I find no peace and all my war is done. I fear and hope, I burn and freeze like ice. I fly above the wind, yet it cannot arise. And naught I have and all the world I seize on. That loseth nor locketh, holdeth me in prison. Nice rhyme there. And holdeth me not, yet I can scape no wise, nor letteth me live nor die at my device. And yet of death it giveth me occasion Without eyes I see, and without tongue I complain. I desire to perish, and yet I ask for health. I love another, and thus I hate myself. I feed me in sorrow and laugh in all my pain. Likewise displeaseth me both life and death. And my delight is causer of this strife. So the first section is just him complaining about how bad he feels. And um, yeah, even though his war has, is done, he's not at peace. So there's these juxtapositions, these antitheses of peace and war in the, the first line of the poem. Then we have another two, fear and hope, another two, burn and freeze like ice. So there's these extremes going on in the psyche of the speaker, these polarities that are, um, you know, he's switching between two very opposite states of being constantly, and that is causing him to be unsettled and not peaceful or at rest. He has nothing, but he seizes on hold all the world. And he kind of feels like everything makes him feel like he's in prison. And he's not sure about whether he wants to live or die. He's displeased by life and death. He desires to die, to perish, but he asks for health. So he kind of wants to live and wants to die equally strongly at the same time. The only thing that really gives us any insight into what, you know, why does he feel like this is um, the quote that you can see on the left here. I love someone else, therefore I hate myself. Strange logic. Um, yeah, so he's in love. But this love is not good. We don't really know why it's not good. But whatever the reason is, it's causing him to hate himself. It might be because the person he's in love with is awful. And um, you really shouldn't be in love with her. It might be because the person he loves, I think this is more likely, the person he loves is, um, you know, not possible for him to be with. Like she's already married or she's of a certain part of society that is unworthy for him to marry. Um, so we have this theme of unrequited love coming through where you, you have an imbalance in love. 
So we're going a little bit deeper into the poem now. So the speaker is in the throes of love. They've got this extremely powerful feeling where they're pining for another, but it's unrequited. We sometimes call this the trope of the Petrarchan lover. So a Petrarchan lover is a lover who's complaining um, because they don't, um, you know, their love that, that they feel very intensely and powerfully and honestly can't be fulfilled or uh, reciprocated because of whatever reason. Sometimes you can call these poems lover's complaint poems as well. So you, you can use that term Petrarchan lover. You can also use that term lover's complaint. So it's unclear exactly why. And I think he's sort of hiding the reason because if it's true that um, Wyatt himself really loves someone who he's not allowed to be in love with, it would actually be dangerous for him to publish a poem um, where it was obvious who that person was. So he's he's probably deliberately obscuring uh, the identity of the lover from public view, I think. Maybe she doesn't feel the same. Maybe society would disapprove in some way. Um, but yeah, all of the positivity of love is twisted into stress and strife and agony because of the lack of union. So there's quite a lot of techniques here. Um, I've just picked up on a few for you just to kind of look through in detail. We've talked about antithesis already and juxtaposition. Um, there are quite a lot of interesting verbs. So if you want to do some precise language analysis, go deeply into the use of verbs there. And also deeply into the different metaphors. There's a ton of metaphors, sort of one after the other that he's using to express this negative state of mind. Structurally, this is a sonnet. It's also a Petrarchan sonnet. So, you know, I said it's the Petrarchan lover. He's also using the form of the Petrarchan sonnet. So um, this word Petrarch, he was an Italian guy who invented the sonnet form. When Wyatt was writing, Italian literature was actually far more um, popular and more powerful than English literature. So the English poets kind of stole the Italian uh, styles that they'd made and tried to make kind of their own English versions. So he's, he's taken from that Italian um, tradition of the sonnet, which Petrarch, who's um, another poet, he invented it and he's using it for his own ends here. So it has a very specific structure and you can go really deep into the structure of sonnets, what they mean, how they work. They follow a certain thought pattern, they shift thought pattern at certain points. Um, so feel free to analyze that deeply, research that deeply if you're interested in the sonnet form and if you feel like you want to do a really really good essay that goes in detail with that it's not necessary for a decent grade but if you're aiming for like a super top grade that might be something that you want to do to just kind of give yourself like even more to analyze um so yeah you've got this kind of linking really of couplets a b b couplet a a couplet b b couplet and then cc here as well couplet so rhyming couplets create a feeling of love. Um, they create a chain of rhyming sounds that move the poem forwards as well. Traditionally, rhyming couplets are always used in love poetry. There are also sejura, these pauses in the line. You might go back and look at the punctuation of the poem. It's actually, um, you can see, you know, there's these dashes, there's some commas in the center of lines. Sometimes there's a very short sentence like this one. All of that is really good stuff for you to analyze as structure. So you can think more about why did he do that? What is the effect of that there? Yeah, so a little bit of uh, analysis on Wyatt, interesting guy, kind of weird. <laughs> I always, I have a pic, uh, sorry, a book of poems of Thomas Wyatt with this picture on the cover. So whenever I picture Thomas Wyatt, this is the exact image, um, just his eyes <laughs> that, yeah, that crop up. Um, it's by a, a very famous uh, painter as well, Holbein. And yeah, so his poems often explore love. Um, he's a really good sonneteer, so he's actually quite a master of that sonnet form. And um, in the Renaissance, the time that he's writing, 
love was not really like marriage wasn't about love and love wasn't about marriage and who you really love or who you care loads about was not really anything to do with who you should marry because marriage was predominantly a societal decision to do with your status, your wealth, your class, that kind of thing. So these types of sonnets were very popular because loads of people were stuck in marriages that they didn't want from a young age and they were in love with someone they couldn't be with. Um, so you can see in the context that actually this is a, a real strong response to the strict society of the time. Especially those in the king's court, the gentry and aristocrats at the highest levels of society would read these types of sonnets. Wyatt was imprisoned twice in his life. He's, he's bad. <laughs> he's not really that bad, but he's, you know, he went to prison. Um, once was for having an affair with Anne Boleyn, who eventually got her head chopped off by King Henry VIII because she's the second wife of King Henry VIII. And he beheaded her. He chopped her head off um, because he didn't trust her and thought she was unfaithful and he wasn't, you know... Um, he, she didn't give him an heir that he wanted. There's all kinds of reasons. Uh, but yeah, he's very crazy, King Henry VIII, and he eventually killed Anne Boleyn. Apparently, Wyatt had an affair with her. He was imprisoned because there was an alleged affair. So maybe that's the love interest. Maybe it's someone different. It would make sense if it is Anne Boleyn because obviously that would be a giant thing to... You know, you would, there's no way you would write a poem that says that you're in love with the king's wife. That's terrible. So, um, yeah, maybe the identity of this, um, you know, love interest is so hidden because it was actually Anne Boleyn. Um, yeah, and so there's a little bit more as well here about the Petrarchan lover. So you can read in detail about that. Do use that as a context point if you write an essay on this poem because it's just really... Um, Yes, it's a very good, precise, detailed context point that you can use. So make sure you understand what is a sonnet, who is Petrarch, what's a Petrarchan sonnet, and what's a Petrarchan lover. Just make sure you research that if you're not sure. Good, so there's some attitudes here. We've kind of talked about these already, so you can just kind of look through them in your own time. Uh, you can also download this document from the scribbly.com website and um, yeah, access loads of more video lessons and so on, things there as well. If you want extra help with your poetry or your literature or even your English in general. There's some themes here that you can turn into little mind maps. I always find this is a really good exercise for kind of reflecting your understanding of the poem. So you, you put one of the themes in a bubble in the center of a page. Then you draw little lines out of that and each line has its quote, own quotation linked to it. And then you have some little lines coming off those quotations that have notes of analysis of, you know, what you could say about it, how it relates to the theme, maybe techniques that it uses as well. So I've been a tutor for 11 years and I've made so many students, poor students, do this type of mind mapping of themes for all kinds of different literary texts. And it always makes them write really good essays. So you might notice if you watch many of my videos that I always tell you to do this, there is a reason behind it. Um, yeah, it always results in a much better essay if you do that task. So then when you're ready, you can plan and write maybe one or two of these essay questions. You don't have to write a full essay even. You can just write a bit of an essay to kind of try it out if you like as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. Hopefully you like this poem. I think it's really good. Um, I'm intrigued about this mystery of who, who she is. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it's a good poem overall. So yeah, thank you for listening and I'll see you guys soon in a future lesson.